Okay, so we'll start the program. I want to uh, thank everyone for joining this uh, virtual uh, bullpen number 17. And uh, one of the things I want to do first is introduce myself as uh, Mario Casabona, one of your co-hosts and the Tech Launch founder. And uh, what uh, the, the other two individuals that are going to be working with me, predominantly working, is Robin Baer, co-host, and she's one of our senior Tech Launch advisors, as well as Eric Korb, who's going to be our web master, and he's a senior uh, Tech Launch uh, advisor as well. Next, please. So one of the things I want to start out with, and I'm going to read this, and I don't plan on doing this for any of the other slides, uh, but it's important. So the mission that um, uh, Tech Launch has is to commercialize emerging technology by finding and nurturing early stage tech ventures to accelerate growth via mentoring, coaching, networking, and access to resources and capital. The Tech Launch name is synonymous with New Jersey entrepreneurship and to date has proudly served nearly 100 tech focused companies and mentored over 175 and actually I've, I've lost count. So uh, I think those are the recent numbers. Next. Great. So what, what I want to briefly do is describe the three um, uh, initiatives that we have. Uh, the first one is the uh, business accelerator. And uh, uh, we conceived or we started uh, the original tech accelerator first, the New Jersey's first tech accelerator back in 2012. And we provided seed capital and mentoring and co-working space through a 16 week accelerator program. We launched 26 new ventures with the help of over 150 mentors in our network. In 2017, we pivoted to a virtual business accelerator model, which has helped over 60 new ventures through mentoring and pitch events like this. The other initiative is Tech Launch's Startup Bootcamp Weekend. We created um, the Bootcamp Weekend program for aspiring entrepreneurs for thinking about starting their own venture, or in some cases, wanting to better understand what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And in, uh, we actually had two of them, and both of them were oversubscribed, and we had over 25 participants in each one. Then most recently, we launched uh, Tech Launch's Office Hours program, and it was in response to the much needed mentoring uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown, we tried to um, uh, fill some of the gaps and help the entrepreneurs and startups. We created the weekly free office hour program to provide mentoring and coaching. So all these activities and initiatives are focused on growing New Jersey's entrepreneurial and startup ecosystem with homegrown, successful entrepreneurs and investors. Next. So now we uh, will we'll get into the program. And what I'd like to do is for the panel members to do a brief uh, self-introduction. And uh, we'll start with Gina. So if you don't mind, please, Gina, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Hi everyone, um, I'm Gina Tedesco and I'm the managing member of Amala Ventures, which is a um, angel investment uh, company that I started uh, a few years ago. I'm actually a serial entrepreneur and I started investing back in um, 2009. I'm also a member of Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network and I am uh, on the board there as well. And I'm also the New Jersey chapter leader for Golden Seeds, which invests um, in companies that have women in the C-suite. And I look forward to participating and giving some feedback to uh, the companies that are presenting tonight. Great, thank you, Gina. And to one of our new participants, Janelle, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Janelle Benjamin. I'm currently an angel investor through Portfolio and privately. Um, I came to this side of the table via my own exit. I sold my... Um, predictive analytics company to Nielsen Ratings about 18 months ago. So 
Good luck. I'm very excited to see the pitches today because I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Janelle. I totally understand. Catherine, please. Hi. I'm Catherine O'Neill. Uh, am I, am I, I'm muted? Yes. Okay. I'm Catherine O'Neill. I'm an active angel investor with both Jumpstart uh, in New Jersey and uh, Broad Street Angels in the Philadelphia area. Uh, very active uh, uh, with the Angel Capital Association, which is a national group for angel investors and angel groups, as well as on the board at Rowan University for their venture fund. So really um, happy to really uh, assist and give advice to Great. Thank you, Catherine. And Steve. Please. Uh, good afternoon, Steve Dyer. I am a uh, angel investor through Jumpstart. I've been uh, investing through Jumpstart since uh, 2007. I'm currently the chairperson. Uh, prior to that, I spent about 18 years on Wall Street, um, initially at Payne Weber, which was then acquired by uh, UBS. And I'm uh, looking forward to today's event. Great, thank you. And, and welcome to uh, all four of you. And thank you for taking the time and having the patience uh, to listen through the pitches. Thank you. Next. I've got to unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, so, so uh, Eric, you must have read my, um, my lips. Um, so the, uh, the other thing I want to do is extend my appreciation to our uh, event partners. Uh, Jumpstart New Jersey Angel Network, uh, one of the premier uh, angel groups in the Mid-Atlantic region, and I'm also a member, uh, and you heard that Steve is the chairman, uh, and Gina is also, and Catherine also is an uh, angel investor in Jumpstart. Then the other uh, event partner is Tech Council Ventures. Uh, I think they've, uh, I think it's the, the second or third fund, and they've raised about $50 million. They're actively investing uh, and our good friend Steve Sokoloff and uh, Jim Gutton are the managing directors. Um, and then um, uh, Casabona Ventures, uh, which is uh, mine. It's a micro VC fund, uh, which I invest uh, my angel or my seed uh, 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 funds. Uh, Gibbons Law, one of the premier uh, law firms in New Jersey and nationally, and they're located in Newark. Um, Gerhardt Law. Um, really specializes in uh, intellectual property. Uh, and thank you, uh, Gerhardt. Uh, Witham Smith & Brown, one of the premier accounting firms as well um, in the New Jersey and metropolitan and nationally. Now, uh, I wanna remind everyone that the bullpen winner or the whatever uh, company the panel selects, whomever the panel selects, um, gets to present at Jumpstart Angel Network meeting as well as the Tech Council Ventures meeting. Um, you, so it's, you bypass the screening process and you could uh, directly pitch to those two uh, entities. In addition, the other four uh, partners are providing $15,000 uh, worth of advisory service. So now at this point, uh, I wanna turn it over to Robin and she can take it over. So thank you very much and I'll see everyone later. Great, thank you, Mario. Uh, so, hello and welcome to everyone. I am coming to you from uh, Tech Launch Virtual Headquarters, as you can see. <laughs> um, so there's a couple things that are different. Um, some of you are maybe very familiar with our in-person uh, bullpen pitch competitions. Um, we're following some of the same format, tweaking it a little bit differently just to uh, fit the virtual format here. So I'm just gonna go over that with you and uh, explain what we're, what we're doing today. Uh, first, we're going to have, each, this is for each, each pitch presentation, a seven minute pitch by the founder or CEO, um, followed by a seven minute Q&A from the audience. This is where we really do wanna hear your feedback and hear your questions. So uh, we'd like you to use the Q&A function. Um, most of you are familiar with Zoom and how this goes, but uh, for those of you who, who aren't, it's at the, um, it's at the bottom of your screen. There's a, a little button for, 
for Q&A, that's where you should put your questions. Feel free to submit those during the pitch um, or wait until the end of the pitch and put them in there. But th that's where I'm going to be looking for the questions and moderating from that from that source. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to read that to the uh, founder, so it won't be totally um, live for you to ask your question, but that's where I'll get your questions and I'll pick them up from that source. Um, that will be followed by a seven minute uh, uh, feedback session from the from the investor panel. So we'll listen to their comments, um, their feedback, their concerns and their issues. And those are, that's a really great uh, session. If there are any founders who are actually in the audience listening today, um, that's great to hear what, what an investor is looking for and the types of questions that they might be asking. Um, so pay attention to some of those things. Um, after each presentation, um, we will have a short break. Um, this is, a, uh, it's important to know it's a two minute break. It's just to allow our investor panelists uh, time to complete their scorecards. Um, they're gonna be doing that online. You'll hear uh, members of the audience, you'll hear some music playing. That's just a short intermission. Um, we'll have some information on the, on the screen, on the slide for you. And then we'll get right back into the next presentation. At the end, uh, we will vote, the audience will vote, um, because we really are very interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, we, you're going to vote on your favorite presentation. Who gave the best pitch? Um, could be, uh, you know, who, who sang the best song, who gave the best song and dance. Um, just, you know, who did you really respond to? That's your chance to really uh, put that in there. The panel is going to focus on five main metrics. Um, all of these five metrics together uh, constitute who they feel is most fundable. And these five metrics are team, who they feel um, has the, the talent and the ability to execute on this plan. Um, product, which could be product or service. It could be things like intellectual property. Um, uh, have they demonstrated um, a, a minimum, minimally viable product? Market size and need. How have they assessed their market and have they really addressed how they're going to, to match that need, that product market fit? Um, capital raise and use of funds. The panel is going to be looking at what they've done so far in terms of their capital raise and how well that will sync up with some of their uh, timetables and milestones. And then finally, their overall presentation quality. And as Mario said, the winner uh, of this pitch competition as determined by the investor panel will get the opportunity to pitch to Jumpstart Angels and Tech Council Ventures and receive up to $15,000 worth of in-kind services from our event partners. So with that said, I think we have our first, uh, first presenter up is Bright Cloud International. Bright Cloud is built on $4.1 million in grants and is FDA registered and market ready. Phase two studies have showed statistical improvements for stroke and Alzheimer's patients, overall a $383 billion market. So I'd like to introduce Ed, Ed Burday, President and CEO of Bright Cloud International. Ed. Thanks, Robin. So as Robin said, I'm Ed Burday, I'm the CEO of Bright Cloud, and we're an established FDA registered med tech company that's poised to disrupt the $383 billion post-acute market for neuromuscular and cognitive rehab. And we're starting with stroke. Uh, Bright Cloud was funded uh, through over $4 million in uh, SBIR grants, and we've gone through over a dozen clinical studies already and proven efficacy in improving outcomes for stroke, TBI, Parkinson's, and other conditions. Next. Our, next problem, please. Thanks. Our entire team is dedicated to virtual rehabilitation and digital medicine. Dr. Uh, uh, next slide, thank you. Dr. Berdia, uh, the founder of Bright Cloud, is a tenured professor with over 20 years of experience in telerehab, and he ran the Rutgers Telerehabilitation Institute, and he also established the International Society for Virtual Rehabilitation, which has over 100 members uh, across multiple countries. So our team has, uh, half of our team is PhDs. Our clinical um, neurologist is the director of neuropsychology at Robert Wood Johnson. Our occupational therapist won, won the NSF award for American Women in Science. And I came on board last year to commercialize the company after establishing the field of digital medicine through my prior company that I successfully spun out of the Mount Sinai Health System, which you may know if you're familiar with the digital health space, RX Health. Next, please. Our, 
clinical system is complete already, and we just started commercializing this year, and we already sold our first clinical unit into a major rehabilitation center. Our technology is based around clinical rehab sessions for neuromuscular and cognitive deficiencies. It uses AI and machine learning to engage the patient in physical and cognitive tasks while measuring critical diagnostic data. And you know, in, in medicine, that data is what's, what's so important. That data is what allows us to tailor to, to the patient. All the data is stored up in our HIPAA compliant cloud servers and the system has built-in reporting so the physician can see the results both for individual clinical sessions as well as longitudinally to track the patient's uh, long-term long -term progress. The clinical sessions are based on virtual reality, not within a headset per se, though we do have clinical studies going on right now around uh, headset, head-mounted displays, but really looking at VR that's engaging and presented on a large display with the patient operating controllers in 3D space. I came on in November to commercialize the product and to take the larger clinical system that we have and repackage it into a device for the home, which is really where everything in medicine is going. Robin? Uh, next, please. Our, our home system will provide rehab at one-tenth the cost of uh, facility-based care. So looking at just stroke, the average cost of facility-based care post-stroke is over $17,000 per patient. The costs are due to in, inpatient care, which for moderate to mild post-stroke is not always necessary. For appropriate patients, we can provide care at a fraction of the cost of a facility while providing more frequent sessions within the comfort of the patient's home and not exposing them to the risks of a skilled nursing facility. Next, please. And home rehab, of course, has multiple beneficiaries. In addition to more therapy sessions uh, for the patient, there are new digital medicine CPT payment codes for physicians, which open up new revenue streams for providers. And now during the pandemic, Medicare is paying one-to-one -one for telemedicine sessions which means physicians can work with patients while they utilize the system and be paid the same as if they were actually within their, their clinical setting. Uh, and of course, payers and other at-risk entities are the major beneficiaries since they are the ones that, that receive significantly reduced cost of patient care. Next, please. So this is an artist rendition of our home device that gives a clear picture of what our rehab looks like in the home. The system is the same as our larger clinical system next to me, only it's compacted. So the at-home clinical sessions are the same as what we do on the larger clinical device. Um, we've already successfully run clinical studies in the home using our larger version of the system for patients who were chronic post-stroke. And we showed statistically significant improvement in motor skills, cognition, verbal fluency, uh, through the continuous therapy sessions that, that in-home rehab allows. Next, please. Now, in March, when COVID hit, uh, we'd already started working on our port of the clinical version into the home system with a 12-month time frame. It was clear at that point that we needed to move faster to meet the needs of patients who couldn't go into facilities due to COVID. Uh, so really the same reason why we're on this Zoom call. So I made available in March 100,000 of my own personal funds um, through, through financing. And then I put in another 100,000 uh, to really fast track the repackaging of our clinical system into a home device. And we shortened our 12 month time frame down to about four months. And literally last week we completed our first home unit. So now we're raising 1.25 million for go to market and we'll, we'll be cash flow positive within 12 months. And at that point, we'll look to, to do a much larger raise to further establish and, and own the market. Next, please. Of course, this doesn't just help patients. We allow the facilities to recapture the revenue they lost during COVID and at, to, you know, right now facilities are at 50 to 70% loss of patients. So they can recapture that through our telemedicine smaller home device. Uh, next, please. So this is our, our these, these are our four year revenue forecasts. Um, it's important to note we had 453,000 in revenue from grants last year, and we currently have two phase one grants totaling $686,000. Uh, I also included two versions since we get a bump in net positive earlier if, if Medicare continues to allow full payment for uh, home-based telemedicine. But I think the point here is that it's a very appealing business model in, in either fashion. Next, please. 
Also on financials, our addressable market is, is really enormous. It's, uh, the TAM for just stroke is $34 billion, giving us $4 billion of real capturable revenue just for stroke alone. Uh, total post-acute market is $383 billion. And next, please. And finally, we have seven issued patents and three additional in progress, making us an acquisition target really just on the IP alone. Uh, together with our completed product, our dozen clinical trials, we can post up some, some pretty major barriers to entry. And just as an example of the value of our patents, this year we received the patent for diagnosing Alzheimer's through computer games. And diagnosing Alzheimer's early can save payers literally billions of dollars, not to mention the value for, for pharma. Next, please. So again, my name is Ed Burday. Our company is BrightCloud. We're raising 1.25 million for go-to-market to disrupt cognitive and neuromuscular rehab through our proven uh, home device, starting with post-acute stroke. Thank you. Great, Ed, thank you so much. Um, so now we will open this up for audience questions. And um, folks who are listening, please put your questions into the Q&A uh, section. It's down below in the bottom of your screen. Um, we've got a few questions there already, but we really would like to see your input. Um, that's the place where you, uh, where you put that in. Um, so Ed, a couple of questions for you. Um, the first is about, um, do we get to see the system in operation? So uh, I guess that the question is really, is there a demo available um, for folks to see? So yes, our, we have um, six of these units up and running right now, the larger clinical system. Um, this one next to me, I'm in my home, so this is a dev system that I'm, I, I'm the CEO, but I also obviously get my hands dirty a little bit. So I can't present on this system right now, but, um, but I'm happy to do a demo for, for in investors or, or anybody that's uh, curious. You can, um, my, my email isn't up on the screen anymore, but hopefully if you caught my email, it's ed at brightcloud.health. Um, certainly reach out to me and we can set up a demo. Okay, great. Um, and can you address um, the competitive landscape? What is available in the market now that is, is being used? And are there competitive products that are also coming up on the horizon? How do you see yourself positioned against, uh, in your competitive stance? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so right now there are uh, two other systems that are larger like this clinical system next to me. Um, they're really, that the larger systems really aren't appropriate for in-home use, uh, which is why when I came on board in November, my, my background in digital medicine was really pushing me for, for the goal of getting this system compacted into a home medical device. And that's what we've done over the last months. And so we're, we're now at the point where we have a home medical device for uh, post-acute stroke and, and other, um, and other uh, conditions. So, so we're really first to market with that there's nothing else that's both low cost um, and, and able to treat those conditions in the home. Um, there is another system, you know, there are other systems like ones that have head, head mounted displays, uh, like you would, you would think about for VR. Um, those require a, a physician next to you to use, so those aren't also appropriate for home use. So we can really go out and capture the market very quickly because it was very difficult for someone to come up and go through all that research we've done and all of the different um, steps that we've taken and, and actually get it packaged into a, a home device. Okay, great. Um, we have another question here. Um, do you currently have any partnerships with international organizations? You know, the word international is in the title of your company. So um, obviously there was some vision going on there. So what, um, how do you see this rolling out globally? That's, that's also a great question. So um, two tracks really. First, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Greg Berdia, who is the founder of Bright Cloud, started an international society for virtual rehabilitation. So, so we, we look to use that as a conduit into other countries um, because that, that is multi-country multi already. Uh, in addition, as, as we are going globally, um, in the past, I had founded RX Health, which I mentioned that some people probably will know about in the digital health space. And we have a lot of international contacts. I have a lot of international contacts through that, both in Australia, uh, in, in Israel, um, in Brazil. So, so really looking at, um, at going global fairly quickly. Also, also in China, I had an investor that invested in that company from China and can maybe help bring us into there. 
So we are looking to go, go international very quickly, but, but first we really want to establish ourselves in the US. Okay, okay, great. So, so it is part of your eventual go-to-market strategy or rollout. Yeah, Robin, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, oh, we've got lots of questions here. Um, what is the price point for the home system and what work have you done to measure the appetite for health insurance providers to cover the costs or is the plan to have patients cover the cost? So in, in essence, um, um, have, have you found that, um, is your system designed to already fit with some of the insurance third-party payer codes? Um, or are you planning to look at new codes? Um, and how is this cost actually borne out? Who's bearing the cost of the system? Right, another, another really good question. So, so our system is provided at no cost to the provider. That, that was a, one, one thing that we wanted to do. So we, we do a leased system to the provider. Um, and, and all the costs for the system are based on a percentage of revenue, that, which is new revenue for the provider that they're able to gain through CPT codes that are specifically for digital medicine. So uh, um, Patel, who, who headed up um, uh, and, and pushed for these new CPT codes for digital medicine, um, what we were at, at sometimes, uh, my, my past co-founder was working with him to, to really get some of these pushed, pushed forward. And so we ended up, um, uh, in the last year, they went from three CPT codes for digital medicine up to now, um, over seven digital medicine CPT codes. So those can all be used. Uh, and, and we really look for, like I said, a, a percentage of revenue. So, so we don't, um, necessarily need to have new CPT codes introduced. We can do that on the remote monitoring and existing ones that are out there right now. And then, you know, in the short term, as, as I mentioned, Medicare has opened it up that telemedicine systems like ours can allow for um, full one one to one payment as if the patient was already within the facility. So so in that sense, um, we're able to both allow facilities to rehire their furloughed employees. And, and recapture some of that revenue, as well as help all the patients that really can't get into facilities right now. And, and again, all of that is done um, through, through existing CPT codes, a percentage of that. So it's new revenue for the provider. Okay, so interesting. So your business model is really that this is a leased system to the provider. So you're really selling to the providers um, with, um, uh, with for, for the patients to use it, it's, it's covered by their insurance. Is there ever a case where it's not covered by insurance or have you tested any of that yet? So um, eventually we may look to, to take different business strategies, um, working directly with payers because ultimately payers do benefit the most from the systems. There's also uh, other groups out there that are payer providers right, where, where it's a, a provider who's also at risk themselves, they're an at-risk entity, where, where they're financially, they're um, bearing the financial burden of the, of the population that they're treating. So in those situations, um, it, it really motivates them to want a system like this, where, where if there are patients that can go discharge to home, they can discharge to home as opposed to having to put them into a facility, um, you know, if that's appropriate for the patient. Uh, but, but absolutely, we really look at, we really look at um, the, eventually long-term uh, payers and payer providers um, uh, helping to fund the system or, or opening up, you know, even, even new codes for, for systems like this. Okay, great. And of course, with COVID, everything is going towards the digital medicine. Digital medicine track has taken a wonderful, I mean, it's not for the best reason, but, but what was going to happen in medicine is happening now so quickly because of the, the pandemic, which is um, hopefully in the long run good for medicine. Right. Right. Ed, thank you so much. That actually uh, filled out our seven, seven minute uh, Q&A session. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank the audience for putting in some great questions. Um, I have not gotten a chance to actually address all of them. So I think if there's a few that you really want an answer to and to follow up, I'm sure our, our uh, presenters would be happy to address them offline and, and speak with you after the event to address your question if you feel that it wasn't answered live at this time. Um, so now we'd like to turn this over to our panel. Um, we're going to get from the uh, perspective of the investors about this, this opportunity. So um, first up, we'd like to hear from Gina, Gina Tedesco. Um, we'd like to hear your thoughts about Bright Cloud International. Do you have questions and feedback for Ed? 
Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Ed. Great presentation. I had a couple questions. Actually, the audience took a few of my questions. So um, <laughs> there's some, some great people in the audience. I, I also had a question about competition. And I think part of the reason why that question came up and maybe some of the other ones about the business model is maybe in your presentation, you could have put that uh, a slide in about competition and also something about the business model. I think one of the things that I still didn't quite get a handle on is um, how many units you need to sell, um, how do you sell them? Is it hardware and a software component? So maybe a little bit more about the product up front. And I think that would help um, maybe clarify uh, the questions that you got. So um, I don't know if you want to, you know, talk a little bit more about your technology, but um, I'm assuming it's partly a, a leased option with hardware, but there's a software component as well, I would imagine. Right, right. And, and yeah, thank, thank you. So seven minutes is tough. <laughs> We have to keep moving. So, um, so absolutely. Um, so we, we really look at, it's a hardware component and a software component. That's right. The hardware component is, is necessary because we do have uh, controllers um, and proprietary controllers in some cases for different, different conditions, different medical conditions. Uh, the, the system itself, as, as we lease it, it is, it is purchased by the physician or the you know, primary care physician or by a um, a group, and then it's usable by, by patients for a period of time that they, that they need it. Um, if you were looking at some, you know, I, I know you were looking maybe for our, our break-even points and things mm -hmm. like that. So, so we would expect within the first, um, the first year to have well over a thousand units um, out, out in the market. That's something that we, we can achieve, um, and we can stand up a sales team pretty quickly to, to, get, that, to get to that point. Um, and, and as I, I mentioned kind of earlier, we're looking at, at within a 12 month time frame, uh, the, the turnaround point where, where we'll be able to, um, to, to really hit that break even point because that's when revenue sort of comes, comes back and, and, and starts to, to help fund the, the sales team and everything else that's necessary. Okay, great, thanks. Okay. Great, next we'd like to hear from Janelle. We'd like to hear your thoughts. Hi, oh, right great. Back. Great presentation. Um, yeah. I liked how you talked about the telemedicine trends and billing and things like that. I feel like sometimes, you know, pre these presentations kind of focus on the product and that pullback for the whole market helped me feel comfortable that you guys had really deep knowledge of this market. Um, echoing Gina, I could have seen more on the business sort of model and operation and just, you know, how many in, how many out, what's the dollar signs and more on competitors. And I would, would say one, it could definitely use like a storytelling visual sweep. Um, I thought that what you were saying was, um, didn't match sort of the tone of the slide sometimes, uh, but overall thought it was very interesting and cool product. Thanks, John. Great, thanks, Janelle. Um, next up, Catherine O'Neill. Catherine, do you have feedback for Bright Cloud? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed, I think it was a good presentation, uh, but I'm going to echo some of the uh, other comments. It's hard to grasp the sweep of the business plan itself. Um, you, you're raising a certain amount of money now. It will take you how long. You will certainly have another raise after that unless you think you're going to be cash positive. It's hard to, it's hard to get that flow of where the business is going. And, you know, when will, when you will have the, the a thousand units out, uh, when, uh, uh, what uh, manufacturing uh, process you're going to do in that. So just a better feel for actually the mechanics of uh, launching the product. And it certainly you've covered the value very well to both the physician and to the patient. Um, but I think more numbers, uh, for the investors would be good. Thanks, Kat. Okay, great. Um, and finally, Steve Dyer. Good job, Ed. I thought you uh, did a very good presentation. I, I think uh, angel investors always like to see uh, the CEO reach into his pocket and put some money into the... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you twice. <laughs> the fact that uh, you did it to accelerate uh, your, your path to the market was good. Um, I, I had a question and, and, and it's, it's a balancing act, I guess, or a comment. It's a balancing act. Certainly, uh, a 
you know, the 1.4 will get you to break even, I think you said next year, or, or the, the capital raise. And then, you know, as you go through that, you and get to positive cash flow, you also want to balance, do I go after additional um, uh, solutions, uh, uh, other problems, Alzheimer's I know is in there, um, or do I do them sequentially? And obviously that's a capital issue. Um, but I thought it was a very good presentation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one for us too. Like when do we move into other conditions? Uh, and, and the biggest part for us is getting cash flow positive prior to the next raise. So we look at, at once we're cash flow positive in 12 months, then we're in a position company-wise to go for a, a much bigger raise with a, uh, a much better position for valuation. So That makes a lot of sense. Good job. Thank you. Thank you to the panel uh, for, your, for your comments. Um, this slide shows some of our senior mentors. Um, Tech Launch is a volunteer organization. Um, these mentors all give of their time uh, and expertise to work with startup companies and founders um, to address different areas um, or challenges that those companies are facing. Um, one of the things that we've just launched uh, this summer is rotating office hours. So every week we'll have a different set of mentors uh, uh, volunteer their time and um, uh, be able to work with with startup companies um, to to address certain issues that they're having if you are a founder in the audience um, and you're um, looking for some ec advice um, or um, expertise um, please get on the tech launch mailing list and uh, watch LinkedIn for these announcements every week. It's a different set of, of uh, advisors. Um, look for one who thinks you think might have a um, special uh, expertise in your industry or in your area and reach out to them and connect with them and they'd be happy to help. Our next presentation is Baru. Baru allows you to resize furniture in augmented reality before buying. Baru, Baru makes it in your hometown and delivers it the following week. Uh, our presenter will be Tino Go, CEO and founder. And um, Tino, I'm going to tee you up, but I'd just like you to pause for a minute because I think we have a technical issue um, folks, just bear with me. <laughs> bear with us. We have a, a slight technical issue. We want to make sure all of our investor panels panelists are are ready. So, for our investor panelists, um, the link to the scorecard would be either on your phone or. Uh, in your email and it's a Google form just click the link okay Eric looks good okay sorry for the delay as I mentioned, this is the first time we've done this virtually, so bear with us. We're working out a few kinks. Uh, but it looks like we are ready for Baru. So, Tino, if you are ready. I am. Okay, great. And Eric, are you ready to uh, move the slides? Perfect. All right. Tino. So everyone wants a beautiful home, or at least you want it to work for how you want to live. But most people hate the hassle of furniture shopping. So today I'm going to show you how we're making furniture shopping easier and faster. You can have your perfect home in a, in really, in a effortlessly. And then at the same time, I'm going to give you a peek into how we're reinventing the industry. We're slashing 50% of the costs in the wood furniture industry. Industry-wide, that totals about $9 billion of avoidable costs. The furniture industry is one of the last industries that are using inefficient 20th century practices. Even newcomers like Wayfair are still using those same outdated methods. Next, please. My name is Tino Go. I'm the CEO of, and uh, founder of Baru. 
We are a shared economy platform. Consumers use augmented reality to customize the product they want to buy. Instead of wasting hours shopping, we let cu folks customize the designs themselves. That augmented reality user interface actually controls the manufacturing process. We're using the idle woodworking robots to make the furniture in the customer's hometown. These idle robots are owned by the custom cabinet makers and in every mid-sized and larger city. Since we make it in the customer's hometown, we can deliver the furniture in about a week. Next slide, please. The reason we built Baru is because furniture shopping just stinks. You'll often f spend off hours online or in showrooms and still not find what you need. It's easy to find the style you like, but it's often not available in the color you or size you need. So we've solved that problem. Next, please. Choose the furniture you want and use AR to change the material and the size before you buy it. When the customer buys, we encode that virtual object with the instructions that drive the robots. And because we're making it in the customer's hometown, we can deliver it fast. Next, please. These idle robots are owned by the custom cabinet shops worldwide in, in every mid-sized and major metropolitan area. They're so fast that they're rarely used more than two hours a day by the shop owner. So we created a simple user interface that allows those machines to be deployed and used easily. So in, for recent sales, we've, set up, we've stood up five separate regions uh, for, and we've been able to ship. So the model scales, the model works. Next, please. By manufacturing after the customer buys, we eliminate the need for inventory. Wayfair, as an example, spends about 50 cents the, uh, from every retail dollar on the management and distribution of inventory. The entire industry works essentially the same way. We're choosing to spend that unspent cash, uh, uh, those savings on much better materials for a happier customer. Next, please. Ultimately, we're, re we're innovating uh, the retail supply chain with a customer pull strategy. Most retailers are still using a push approach where they guess what customers will want 18 months into the future and try to get, and then buy it, uh, the inventory and try to get rid of it before the stockpiles become old and obsolete. So we're a collaborative platform that leverages digital manufacturing methods. We're starting with wood furniture, but over time we'll be able to move into other existing or new product categories. So our digitization of the supply chain lets us, to seek, lets us seek margin from the inefficiencies of traditional best business methods. Next, please. We're expanding the market beyond standardized inventory furniture. Using the 80-20 principle, if 80% of shoppers buy $18 billion of wood furniture every year, there might be an up to 3 billion or 4 billion of latent demand because those shoppers were not able to find what they're looking for. We are helping those orphan shoppers. We let them customize exactly what they need and receive it quickly. Next, please. We're starting with home office furniture. We were invited to a number of employee um, benefits, employee perks programs, and we've been selling through them because we've been able to leverage the trust of their, those em employers with their employees. So we'll focus on the 700,000 employees who are enrolled in the Passport Corporate Program. And at the same time, we are also uh, developing our brand strategy and uh, position with Andre Vasegi. Andre led the branding efforts and he architected Kate Spade's iconic brand. Um, next, please. We want to have manufacturing partners in every metro area in the world. 
But we'll start with the 60 largest areas in the US with 225 million people. So if, with just three workshops per region, running four hours of machine time per day, we'll be able to create sales capacity of up to a billion dollars with zero investment. By partnering with these existing workshops, we just access their production capacity and, um, and turn it on, on an as-needed basis. We've proved it can be done with uh, the last few weeks of uh, standing up new regions. So even with, uh, even with those initial startup costs, we're still at you know, showing unit margins which are, which are promising, which look uh, very good. And so um, we can be, na with that evidence, we'll, we'll, we'll endeavor, you know, we'll try to bring uh, all 60 metro areas forward and set up our manufacturing network so that anyone in those regions can buy from us. Next, please. So our, our team includes Kevin Rainbolt. He's a senior software engineer. He's led global engineering teams and projects. He's, he's managed multi-million dollar budgets. The other executive on our team is Leland Thomaset. He's a woodworking industry veteran. He's owned his own shop for 30 years and he is well known in the industry for implementing uh, shop floor automation in smaller woodworking shops. My specialty, my specialty is uh, doing operational and financial restructuring. So I've run, I've overseen a number of companies in a variety of industries, both in the US and in Europe. I'll actually leverage the 10 years of uh, European experience to create our business partnerships in Europe. Tino, that's time. Time is up. Thank you. Okay, we have to open this up to audience Q&A. Um, just as a reminder to the audience, please put your questions into the, um, into the Q&A format. Um, first question, Tino, have you been in touch with local cabinet shops to gauge their interest? Um, in other words, have you done market research to determine the level of interest of those partners? Yeah, 80% uh, of those that, that I speak to are interested. Um, we were able to generate, uh, you know, we got a sale in uh, Washington, D.C., and the next day we had three uh, cabinet shops that were in our, in our network ready to produce for us. They can produce 36 units per day based on four hours of uh, operating time. Okay, great. Um, and uh, who makes the inventory of your digital designs? Uh, that will be a, a collaboration. Uh, we can generate them, many of them internally, and we can also, um, those same machine owners, they have a library of uh, uh, designs that, have, that are no longer being used or sold. They can contribute those for royalty income. And also individual furniture designers and indus industrial designers can also contribute. Okay, and if they are contributing, is that part of your business model? Or if you can um, address, there's a couple of questions in here about uh, the business model, about how many, um, what percentage of revenue do the local shops get? Um, and, and if you can just sort of address that a little bit in more detail. Yeah, sure. So um, the business model is we sell furniture and uh, our profits is, the, is our gross margin minus uh, fixed costs. The, the local shop owners, if we're paying them in low volumes, they're dropping 80% of what we pay them to their pre-tax line. At higher volumes, then we'll get a, you know, more, um, we'll get a better rate. However, they will still increase their total annual profits. Um, the, the designers who contribute uh, products and ideas and designs, uh, they will receive a royalty. Okay, great. Um, lots of questions about that. Okay. Um, if you can address um, um, what is, um, what's really stopping you right now? What is um, the big obstacle for you uh, in terms of rolling out and going to market? If you could, you know, expand on that a little bit. 
Yeah, we, you know, uh, so we got the sales from Google employees with zero cost of um, customer acquisition. And so we just need to uh, make them aware uh, broadly that we exist on their platform. Um, leveraging that uh, trust that employees have with their employer has been a very effective strategy. And we and so uh, the hurdle is just getting a marketing war chest. Okay, and is that something that your um, your capital raise would address? Exactly, seventy percent of everything that we raise will go into uh, sales and marketing. And then 20% um, will go into a little bit of um, website development and um, things like that. Okay. And the rest in, in admin. Okay, great. Um, can you address a little bit about the user experience? Um, the, um, is, there, is there a selection of options for a, a consumer to choose from? And can they uh, upload the design to see it in their own space? Yeah, so the, the way it works is you can choose among any of the designs that we have in our catalog. Um, and, and each design you can scale to the size you need and choose the material and eventually choose, we'll have a configurator for hardware. We're trying to reduce the complexity for the consumer because they're not, they don't necessarily want to deal with complexity. They just want to choose what they want and get it in the size they need it easily and quickly with, without any hassle. And so that's, that's what we're going to do. But eventually we'll also have a login for professional buyers who are equipped and, um, to deal with complexity. And they'll be able to take the same models, the same styles and choose different materials that are not available to consumers and uh, different hardware and and so it will we'll be able to serve different tiers of customers using the same platform depending on that customer group's needs or desires okay great um we have a question here about your patent um what is the patent for is it for using augmented reality for manufacturing furniture or can you talk a little bit more about that and its relation yeah and um in summary, our patent claim is we give consumers control over the manufacturing process, and then there are steps and technologies we use to accomplish that. And so it's a utility patent on the method. Okay, great. Um, we also have a uh, comment in the Q&A that um, you have a customer, a very happy customer who's... Uh, <laughs> pleased with the product. So I just thought I'd put that plug out there. Um, but then we also have a question about how do you handle a customer who's not happy with the finished product? Um, obviously someone who hasn't bought it yet. <laughs> uh, how, do you, well, how do you deal with customer service? Yeah, so if, if they're really unhappy, then we, um, we send the delivery team to come pick it up. We refund back 90% of the price. Uh, we deli we drop off that finished piece of furniture to a consignment shop or to a charity, and it's either tax write-off or it becomes incremental uh, loss mitigation. Okay. And if it goes to a charity, we get we get some good PR out of it too. <laughs> okay, good. Um, there's also some questions about um, quality control because this is a distributed manufacturing model where you've got different manufacturers across the country. How do you ensure that you've got control over the final produced product? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're, we're, um, we've got that pretty well solved and we have evidence of uh, that model works with the recent uh, sales and so the way we do it is uh, we issue the machine code so in the machine code the machines will do what our code tells it to do we buy the material so we avoid 80 percent of the variance associated with that and then we select the shops based on their quality culture if they have a if they've been in operation a long time and they have two hundred thousand dollar machine that's a good starting point but ultimately we choose them for their quality habits because with habits you don't need rules. As a matter of fact, yeah, the rules don't work if you have the wrong habits. So that's how we control for that. And then ultimately, we're all judged by the customer on, and you know, if, they, if, if they're unhappy, then we'll trace back the source and okay. we'll fix it or okay. we'll fix it. 
Great. Uh, Tino, time is up for the uh, audience Q&A. And again, just as a reminder, since there were a lot of questions in the Q&A, we didn't get a chance, may not have gotten a chance to address them all. Um, please reach out to the founder afterwards offline, and I'm sure they would be happy to, to answer your questions. Um, now we'd like to start with the investor panel feedback. And um, this time, Janelle, you will be up first. Um, do you have comments and feedback for Tino with Baruch? Oh, sure. Um, thank you. That was, uh, I, I love this concept. It makes total sense. And I feel like I immediately got it. Um, I would have loved to hear more about this employee initiative with Google and stuff, which, cause it just immediately, it was like, of course, everybody's working at home and you have these crazy spaces that never intended to be offices. So I think maybe digging into that a little bit would have been great. I also felt like I could have just used, someone asked the question about what's the user experience. I could have just used like a user experience storytelling slide um, just so I can, you know, visually three seconds understand what happens on the front end. But overall, I thought that was great. Sorry. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, next, um, feedback from Catherine. I thought the presentation was really interesting, uh, but I'm also curious about what's the average price of one of the pieces of, of, uh, of furniture or whatever's being made. I also uh, is interested, as Janelle was, is was that, uh, was that large contract, was that something that the company subsidized for, um, for their people to buy, or was it something that they just offered to, to their uh, individuals as a, uh, a perk in terms of buying but not, not, not funded by the company. Um, I was trying to get a better feel too for the expansion in dollars of the model. I know you had a slide there. It was a little bit difficult to read. Uh, and I think that more about the, the model itself and the dollars associated with that, maybe additional funding rounds would be valuable too for investors. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, Tino, if you wanted to address any of these comments, you can um, quickly and, you know, in about half a minute address any of this if you need to. Yeah, sure. So uh, the user experience is, uh, is similar to e-commerce. Uh, it's regular e-commerce. You either uh, choose the product on our website and choose the dimensions and material and purchase or you can use our AR app and, and visualize it in your home as you're making that purchase. In terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, Judith, um, uh, Catherine's uh, question, um, it's, it's, it's a gross margin business and we're cash flow positive really quickly as we modulate our fixed expenses according to um, the budget we have and the runway we have. And so that billion dollar um, sales capacity plan assumed a $2 million uh, seed round. That said, the, if you look at the details and look at the projected headcount, there's no way our headcount was going to grow as fast as was modeled. And it was a linear scale too, so it didn't take into account any efficiencies of scale or volume. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Catherine. Did you know? I just said thank you. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Next, Steve. Comments for Barry. Hey, uh, yes, Tino. I thought you did a very good job. Thank you. Um, I thought you're very passionate in what you're doing. Um, uh, one criticism I have though is that you you really got to watch your time, right? You want to make sure if you have seven minutes, you get through your slides in seven minutes. Practice before you go. Maybe next time. But. Uh, um, the $2 million was a number that we really didn't come out in the presentation because we didn't get there of what you're trying to raise. Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's going to be a challenge. B2C is always a, a challenge in getting the word out. And I, I see that you're spending most of the money on, on marketing, which, which makes some sense. Um, and it is certainly an interesting product. And I guess it's going to be uh, boiled down to, at least in my mind, is how successful you are is getting your name out there and getting people to uh, look at look at your product line as an alternative, but uh, it was a good job. Thank you. Okay, great. And uh, finally, last panelist is Gina. Um, oh, thank you so much. This was good, Tina. Uh, Tino, I, um, 
I thought it was a clever idea. Um, it kind of, you know, takes out the uh, capital expenditure of keeping an inventory. I think the one thing that um, was confusing for me was the business model itself and how you were going to market. So the costs, um, maybe a little bit what Catherine said, in, uh, in other words, maybe you should have put that up front and spent a little less time on the concept because I think the concept was really easy to grasp and, and quite clever, but I think the we didn't get to the numbers to, to kind of see, okay, this is something that's viable from a numbers point of view. And it sounds like you did all that work, but we didn't really get to see that. So um, I think maybe putting that somewhere up front um, you know, this is the business model. This is how much it, it, it costs. This is how much we can get. And, and this is how much we're selling to. And then my only other com comment was, I also um, agree with Janelle. I didn't really understand your, and I think Catherine said too, the, the Google relationship. And that sounded very interesting, but I think you glossed over it too much. So, you know, hearing a little bit more about that, that, that you know, was an interesting concept that at how you got into market and maybe are testing the market, but it didn't come out. Um, you know, and, and maybe concentrate more on that uh, next time. Okay, great. Gina, thank you very much for that, that comment. Um, Tino, did you want to address any of that? You have about half a minute left. <laughs> I would love to have another meeting with anyone who wants more details. Um, I think, uh, I think we've been you know I've, we've thought through this uh business very very carefully and we're starting to prove it out i knew it would work because that's my background um now we're proving it um so yeah i'd, I'd love a i'd love a offline conversation thank you okay great thanks Thanks to the panelists. Thank you, Tino. Um, panelists, now it is time to complete the scorecard in your, um, f follow the link, complete the scorecard for Baru. Um, for the audience, we're, it's uh, time for another break. <laughs> um, but first, we want to make sure that you know how to reach TechLaunch. Um, we've got lots of ways to contact TechLaunch. Um, please make sure that you visit the website, techlaunch.com. Um, there are a number of ways to email, um, email info at TechLaunch. Um, if you are in the media and you're covering TechLaunch or you're covering this event um, for different blogs or articles, um, please reach out to Norma, norma at techlaunch.com. She can help you with all kinds of other um, uh, facts, figures, and information. And finally, you should follow us on Twitter, TechLaunchNJ, um, and Facebook, TechLaunch. We will post activities. Mario is a prolific poster. <laughs> He's constantly uh, putting things out on LinkedIn. Um, his thoughts, his feelings, his reactions to the world of uh, what's happening in startups, um, as well as specifically in the New Jersey startup ecosystem. So um, definitely, um, if you haven't already, make sure you, um, if, you, if you're a founder and you have a startup, make sure you follow some of these social media links. Um, okay, we are going to give the panelists a minute to fill out their scorecards. Okay, it looks like we've got the scorecards completed from the investor panel, so thank you. 
Um, next up, our final pitch is Ziotag. Ziotag is a SaaS-based AI-powered video player that makes searching and navigation of video content a seamless experience. Ziotag will pre pre be presented by Jeff Paul, co-founder and CEO. Jeff, are you ready? I am. Great. Uh, thanks, Robin. Hi, I'm Jeff Paul. I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Ziotag. Ziotag is a web platform that makes it easy to watch long format videos. It uses the industry's first AI powered video player to give viewers a better way to watch online videos. Next page. Oh, next one, please. Great. Um, an AI powered video player is a very special player. It's one that automatically generates a searchable tan transcript for any video on the internet. And it also automatically creates an actionable table of contents. That's important because it makes it much easier for our viewers uh, to watch long format video and uh, really consume it well. Next uh, slide, please. Great, so the problem that we solve is long format video are full of great content, but people don't wanna watch from start to finish the entire video just to find that one golden nugget of information that they're looking for. You know, you wouldn't purchase a 400 page textbook or a technical reference manual without a table of contents. Why would you watch an hour long YouTube video without one? Ne next slide. Uh, this, today's standard online video right now only gives the viewer a thumbnail view of the video with the play button along with a generic title and a generic description really does not give you any context or idea of where in the video that topic is being discussed and if you're interested in it and how you can get there. Next slide. That same video, when using the Zeotag AI powered video player is much more interesting. As you'll see, uh, you have a fully searchable transcri transcription, you have an actionable table of contents, you can click around on the table of contents to get right to the part of the video that you're interested in and almost as importantly, skip over the stuff that you're not interested in or you may zero tag a video and decide there's nothing there that you're interested in. You know, so that's the problem uh, we solve. It's super easy for the viewers to use and notice all the different video formats that we support. YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook Live, Zoom. Zoom, who knew three months ago that Zoom was gonna be uh, prolific everywhere, but we do support that platform. Next slide. Using Zeotag is really simple. It's an end user SaaS based B2B uh, product. The way that you Zeotag any video anywhere on the internet is copy the URL of, of the video, place it into your Zeotag account, press a button to create the transcript and can hit the transcribe button. Once the transcription is built, you hit the Zeotag button that uses our AI powered engine to go out and create the actionable table of contents. Um, this transcript can also be exported to um, popular formats like PDFs, words, HTML, or text. It's very simple. You can play the, the video directly from the Zeotag website or if you have a pro or an enterprise account, you can embed it within your blog or your, your own website. Next slide. The market size for online video is just huge. Between digital marketing, podcast, employee training, recorded Zoom sessions like this, e-learning and now distance learning, quite frankly, we stopped counting at $350 billion. Out of that, uh, Zeotag has a very good piece of that market that we can get to. Next slide. Um, our business model, it's B2B. Um, we, have, we do have a consumer model that's free model. Anybody can come to the website and sign up, get their free Zeotag account. It does not include the AI powered um, table, uh, automatic generation of table contents. It doesn't include automatic transcriptions, but they can pay for it. There's a pro account um, that does include auto transcription, does include auto uh, table of contents. 
And there's an enterprise version for larger shops uh, that does additional customization, integration with platforms and things like that. Um, if you have a pro or an enterprise account, you can embed uh, the Zeotag video within your, um, with, within your own website. Next slide. Our unfair advantage of two parts. One is our product. It is an innovative proprietary product built to listen and understand the content of the video and then applies that contextualization to build the actionable table of contents. All of the information that's in there is completely searchable. And two is our team. We have a hand-picked custom blend team, both tech and business, with SMB and enterprise uh, capabilities. Both, everybody's been around, uh, been there, done that. This is not our first rodeo. Next slide. Uh, the competition is um, kind of piecemeal. Wistia, Wistia and uh, YouTube currently has manually built some chapters around it. Doesn't have any intelligence uh, to it. Does not include uh, complete transcriptions around it. There's a small company out of Canada called Searchy that does transcription search around YouTube only. It doesn't do actionable table of contents. Does not include AI. Next slide. The customer acquisition has been pretty good for us. Um, our MVP uh, was delivered in March of this year. Uh, we started selling at the end of May. Um, we have 1,400 people interested in signing up for our free version and convert them to early bird uh, users. Our customer acquisition cost right now is $4 for a free user. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, that could go get to be more expensive, up to maybe $12 or $15 for a free user. Um, that will, uh, roughly we expect one out of 10 free users to buy a um, pro version. And our customer acquisition, we're currently estimating at $150 for a paid user, that'll generate $995 a year uh, in recurring revenue. We expect the customers to stay with us uh, for at least three years. We pre-sold a dozen pro and enterprise clients to date. Next slide. Great, uh, our leadership team is really good. Uh, very talented, Michael Puskar is our co-founder CTO, is an AI and machine learning expert. Um, he has three exits. He's a technical uh, entrepreneur and uh, well-known in the industry. Todd Genitasio, uh, very well-known in the market here, runs a digital agency out of uh, Northern New Jersey. Yeah, uh, thank you, That's uh, time is up. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for that presentation. I know that you had a, a few more slides in there, but perhaps the audience will um, ask some questions that will address some of those, uh, some of those issues. Uh, okay, so let's look at the audience questions. Okay, um, let's see. Um, is this video for creators only? How do I use it when I receive a video from someone else? The good news is that it works on any video anywhere on the internet. You don't have to own the video. You can just view a video and use it. Okay, and um, let that actually leads into another question here. Are there any copyright issues surrounding this if you are using your product, your, your, your SaaS product on somebody else's video? Uh, no, uh, because our technology is uh, non-invasive. So we're not touching the video. We're giving the user a, a better way to watch it. So everything happens around the video. Okay. Um, and do you have patents on this technology? Can you elaborate? We do. We do. We've, we've filed for patents. We, uh, Ger Gerhard is our patent attorney, and uh, we do have patents uh, pending uh, on this uh, specifically around the transcription and the media contextualization capabilities, creating the actionable table of contents. Okay. Um, we have more questions about the, how, how the software work or how the platform will work. Um, are users able to edit the transcript in your software? Yes, they are. Okay, and does that require a big learning curve or how easy, what's the user experience surrounding that ability to work? It's, it's a very simple end user experience. Anybody can use it, a high school student, a 
you know, middle school student would be able uh, to use it. It was built so that your mom could use it. Is it end user product? Okay. Uh, we have a question about the value proposition for B2B customers. What problem are you solving um, in specifically on the B2B uh, level versus a consumer use case? Sure. Uh, anybody that shoots video, creates informational videos, does webinars, Zoom sessions, things like that, understands uh, how expensive it is in terms of money and time and resource to build good content. But if it's long format content, it's um, very difficult for people to find uh, the specific moment in time that they want to get to. So what we do is we're adding significant value uh, to existing content. And si since the pandemic hit, we've, we're having a historic amount of content being generated on Zoom sessions and webinars. So what we do is we make the viewer uh, more uh, productive because they can find the information that they're looking for. And the publisher is happier because um, their people are staying longer and they're sharing it uh, on social media, specifically around individual parts of the video. Okay, great. Um, now, I know that this platform obviously has so many different use cases. Video is really prevalent in, in most industries now, but in terms of your go-to-market specifically, are you focusing on a particular niche or a particular vertical as you start to roll out, or how are you uh, tackling that issue? Sure. So we have a couple of different plays there. Um, we have a very strong play in um, uh, training, uh, corporate training. So we were at the um, a very large training show in September, I'm sorry, in February in uh, San Jose, where we had interest from people like Walmart, uh, Allstate, uh, State Farm, anybody that has thousands and thousands of employees uh, to, um, uh, to train, they have uh, large galleries of videos that are underperforming assets because the students can't find the information that they're looking for. Also events. Uh, company. We have large event companies now that would host trade shows and those trade shows are not happening now. So these large companies have budgets to run trade shows and they're repurposing them into online events and making them searchable and navigable and making them easy to find is really important. Okay, great. Um, and has this been piloted? Have you launched and Yes, so we have, uh, we have a dozen uh, customers right now, uh, both uh, pro customers and enterprise customers. And, and since uh, the end of May, we've uh, uh, closed uh, $25,000 in recurring revenue. Great. And can you address um, what, your, uh, what your capital raise is at this point? Sure, so far we've raised um, half a million dollars in friends and family money. We're doing a raise of up to $2 million, of which we have 150 um, uh, done already. We have a verbal on another 100, and it's going to be used to expand our um, uh, tech capabilities and expand our leadership in that position now and to fund sales and marketing initiatives. Okay, great. It looks like those are the questions that we have. Um, and again, if there are other questions or you feel that your audience, if you feel that your question was not answered, I'm sure you can reach out to Jeff afterwards and um, ask that. Ask hey that Robin, if, yes. if I can add one last thing. Um, this event itself is going to be available on the Zeotech platform by the end of the week. So if people want to come back here and uh, watch it and search it and use it for navigation, uh, they can come to the Zeotag website at zeotag.com forward slash tech launch and they'll see the product uh, in action. Oh, that's great. So we can actually test it out and see what it looks like. Yes, you'll, you'll, you'll see the final product, yes. Okay, okay, great. Wonderful. Okay, so let's move on to the investor panel. So investors, uh, panelists, let's see. I think we have um, 
I'm just looking at my list to see who's up first. I think it is Catherine. You're up first with comments for Jeff. Catherine, are you there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, I thought the presentation was very interesting, but I wanted to see more about the business model. And I know that got left to the end. And I think somehow uh, coming in and talking about that you were launched in the beginning, that you were expecting certain revenues this year, you were seeking certain dollars in the beginning, sort of sets it up for an investor. And then you can spend you know, the, the remainder of the time talking about the product. But you've given us something positive to look at right away. So we know, we know you've launched, you've done some good stuff. And I think that would help a lot because we're, we're, we're scanning to try and see where you are and where you're going. And we need, a few, we need a few numbers to make that happen in the process. So I would suggest a little bit of putting some of your um, achievements up front too as you move through this presentation. Great, that's very good feedback, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, next up, Steve, do you have comments for Jeff? Sure, uh, Jeff, I thought you did a very good job. It's an interesting product. Um, I don't watch a lot of YouTube vi video, but I could see if I did, I'd wanna know what I'm watching in advance. So I, I think it, you do have a, a market out there. Uh, I'll, I'll give the same comment that I gave to uh, uh, the prior presenter, which is, and Catherine kind of alluded to it too, you know, you gotta get through your slides in, this, in the amount of time that you have. So edit where need be but the most important was on what you're looking for and, and the capital and, and the projections. Um, it would have been interesting to see also an exit plan. Um, so you would think one of the big media companies would have a real interest in this at some point if, it, if it's successful and, ha and has uh, uh, allows production to go quicker and get more users. I, I would hope the, that they wouldn't use it to skip through the commercials that where they make their money, but um, it's interesting and uh, I think it's an untapped market. Very good. Great, thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, next panelist is Gina. Do you have feedback for Jeff? Uh, yes, I do. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, nice presentation. Um, I think I echo the comments of my fellow panelists that um, you know you ran out of time and and maybe the good stuff was at the back. Um, I, I kind of thought um, I needed a story at the beginning saying that this was a need to have by some user. And you said you had 12 clients. So, you know, obviously you have that, um, you know, those stories. And I think that would have been more, um, you know, upfront. If you had put that up front, that would have been a better way to start rather than um, talk too much about the techn technicalities about the product. And I think that's where you ran out of time. Um, you know, I think it was easy to understand that it's a table of contents, um, you know, that was well done. And, um, you know, I think the other thing was this whole long form video versus now the TikToks and the short form video. So I was just wondering um, about that market. And, um, you know, there does seem to be an untapped market. And, you know, maybe there's a difference between the two and, and kind of look at, you know, what's your product market fit um, within the, this giant space that, that obviously is expanding. Great. That's good feedback. Great, thanks, Gina. And finally, Janelle. Hi, Jeff. I thought the presentation was great. Um, I think something that often gets forgotten is that you need to sound excited about something you've said about three million times, and I felt like you still actually sounded excited about it. Um, I, echoing Steve, would have loved to see an exit plan, and one of the, I think, maybe an obvious miss was to be talking about gaming, gaming video content and esports, and how this tool could be used for streamer, like gaming streamers that are streaming um, their gameplay, which is huge right now. And I thought highlighting that would be, you know, a little sexier. That's great. Thank you. Great, um, great feedback from everyone. Um, Jeff, we have a few minutes left. In sure. So, so if yes, like anything, what ahead. I'd like to say is our revenue model has us at uh, six, almost $6 million at the end of 2021, at uh, $37 million at 2023. Our 
likely uh, people to buy us are large uh, companies like uh, Microsoft, OpenText, um, uh, somebody like that. Um, Verizon just bought video conferencing company, Blue Jeans Network for $400 million. Um, and um, we, uh, <clears throat> we have uh, great support from angel investors, uh, interested people like Esther Dyson is somebody who found us via, uh, we're used by a bunch of uh, web uh, meetup companies in New York. Uh, New, York uh, New York Tech uh, Meetup uses us, Disruptive Technologies uses us. And she saw us there, she found us out. And uh, she has now has told us she's gonna, she's gonna invest in us and that what we're doing is really revolutionary um, around this. So um, I would say that uh, we're, uh, we're a great team. It's a great product, great feedback uh, around it. Um, you know, we have uh, a good audience of um, business content people around the video. In the gaming space, we've had discussions with some gaming um, uh, companies, very large gaming comp companies, and what they'd like to do is use our technology in conjunction with their computer vision uh, cap capabilities. Um, around it, and they also have people who um, do uh, the commentary around gaming. Uh, they use Twitch. The videos are about six or eight hours long, and they are they have approached us about uh, using uh, a Zeo tag and our IP around making it searchable and navigable. So yes. Well, that that's great that to hear that you're actually um, looking into that. Um, Janelle, I thought that was a great comment of uh, another use case to think of um, and sort of expanding our understanding of, of you know, how these great ideas could actually be innovative in other ways. Um, so thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to Jeff for your answers. Um, at this time, panelists, this is now the third round of voting, so please complete the scorecard for Zeotag. Um, while you are doing that, we would like to um, first, before we launch the poll, I just want to take a minute to um, kind of review some of the key points. The panelists have offered so much great advice uh, coming out of it. Oops, sorry, let me set my turn my timer off. Um, there's so much great advice coming out of it, and I, I, there are three main themes I just want to make sure that the audience um, kind of picked up on. Um, these are things that struck me. Um, one is when you're making a pitch, always be prepared to um, speak to the amount of time that you have for that particular competition. Every competition is different. Sometimes you'll get 10 minutes. In this case, it was seven. And I know that the presenters had to do a lot of work. It was a real challenge to get that down. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a tough one, uh, but you do need to keep in mind of who you're pitching to. Um, second point uh, that kept coming up from, um, from the panelists was this idea of storytelling. Um, you really want to weave a, 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 a nice narrative through your presentation. It's a way to engage your audience. Um, it makes your um, makes your your uh, your pitch that much more compelling. Um, and so that's something to think about every time you go to make a pitch. What's the story I'm trying to convey? And then finally, part of that is how are you using your current milestones and your achievements um, to really communicate that you are on your way? Um, you've got to set up some of those guideposts to um, really take your audience through um, you know, where you are in your, in your growth, in your development. Um, and it just makes it that much easier to follow the story. Um, so those are some of the takeaways that I heard from the panelists. So again, thank you. Great job, panelists, for uh, giving some of, some of that advice. Um, they are going to continue to work on their scorecards um, if they haven't finished already. But now we would like to hear from the audience. Um, this is time for, um, for the poll. And we will launch the poll. So you get one vote. <laughs> One vote per, only one vote per person. Um, please vote for your favorite presentation, overall best company presentation. Okay, it looks like we have closed the poll. And with 56% of the vote, the audience favorite is Bright Cloud International. So congratulations, Ed, Bright, and Bright Cloud International. Just as a reminder, 
Um, the results of the investor scorecards are being tallied. The winner receives an invitation to pitch in front of Jumpstart Angels and Tech Council Ventures. And as well, uh, they can access $15,000 worth of in-kind services from our event partners, Witham, Gearheart Law, Casabona Ventures, and Gibbons Law. And the winner of bullpen pitch number 17, but the first virtual is Zeotag. Congratulations. And I am going to turn this back over to Mario for some closing remarks. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> Next slide. So I've, I've got the privilege to, of making uh, the final um, couple of words, closing remarks. So number one, I just want to repeat that the audience uh, selection is uh, Bright Cloud International and the panel selection, which is really the award, the prize, is Zeotag. So uh, congratulations to Zeotag. Um, you did a, a great job, Jeff, and Ed, so did you, and Tino, uh, you did as well. So thank you for your time and and the actual presentation. I think all three were very good. And if we were physically here or there, we would do a, a clapping of the hands. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I do wanna also thank our uh, senior mentors. You quickly saw their picture a few slides back. Um, again, uh, they're providing all their uh, experience and entrepreneurs experience and investor experience all free so please uh, take advantage of it. Um, and I do send out a weekly announcement of which mentor is available. So if you're interested in being on the mailing list, go to techlaunch.com and enter your mailing list and you'll, you'll be there. Um, number two, uh, the event partners. Uh, thank you very much. Really uh, appreciate uh, the, the prize. Uh, the other thing I, I want to really uh, thank is Robin. Uh, Robin is a success, she's an entrepreneur and she has a successful uh, business called um, Robin Bear Consulting. So thank you very much for your time. You did a great job. Um, and, and thank God it was you and not me. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and Eric, you know, you're the guy behind the scene. I see all these chats going on and I don't know how you keep track of all this and you did a great job as well. Thank you. Um, and Eric himself is a, uh, uh, there he is. Oh no. <laughs> and uh, Eric did a fantastic job. He's an entrepreneur himself. Um, and he's been a fantastic supporter of tech launch and senior mentor and advising me. And both, both by the way, both Robin and Eric are um, uh, one of my advisory uh, group. Finally, um, I want to mention that we have a bullpen 18. The next bullpen is September 15th. If you're interested in applying, go to techlaunch.com and go to the apply page and submit your uh, one page executive summary. Um, at this point, I've got nothing else to say except thank you very much. It was a successful event and uh, hope to see you in uh, Zoom land uh, rather quickly. Thank you very much. Bye-bye to all. And thank you to the panelists. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Panelists were great. Gina, Janelle, Catherine, Steve, great for your feedback. Thank you again. Bye-bye. And keep healthy and safe.